Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, this week is coming on the heels of Red Hat Summit and the lead up to OpenStack Summit. So um, we are really pleased to have Ramon with us, um, who is the OpenStack product manager here at Red Hat, um, to give us a an update on all things OpenShift on OpenStack, I have some insights into some new um, things that are on the roadmap, and I'm going to let, I'm not going to steal any thunder, um, but I'm going to let Ramon introduce himself, and he's got a presentation that's going to last about 30 minutes. Afterwards, we'll have live Q&A. You can ask questions in the chat, um, and we will um, open up the mics right after the presentation. So take it away. Thanks, Diane. Uh, well, uh, welcome everybody. My name is uh, Ramon Asido, and I'm the product manager for a few things in the OpenStack team uh, at Red Hat. Uh, one of them is the integration with uh, OpenShift, uh, OpenShift on OpenStack that I'm going to cover today. Um, let's start by, well, uh, the exposition and consumption of uh, resources in this context. So on the one hand, we have Red Hat OpenStack platform, uh, OpenStack, and uh, on the other hand, we have OpenShift. So OpenStack, as probably many of you know, is an uh, infrastructure as a service platform where you have resources exposed to you, which are consumed usually by tenants or by other applications, right? Uh, as is the case uh, with OpenShift, right? Those resources are commonly in compute, storage, network right and you know they get quite sophisticated as well um we will see some of them as well load balancing as a service for example and then on the consumption side of things we have OpenShift. um open shift is um well uh, what am i gonna say uh, to you about open shift that you don't know but it's a platform as a service that uh well um can consume many of these resources provided by OpenStack. Um, in this case on top of OpenStack, and we are doing it in the same way as OpenShift does it in other platforms, such as uh, AWS, for example, or Azure, etc. Okay, so, yeah, sorry, I skipped one slide. Um, exposition of resources. So here we have OpenStack, which is a platform that um, allows us to automate the provisioning of bare metal loads, virtual machines, storage uh, storage in uh, as block devices for example by a cinder or uh, even as uh, file systems uh, with manila um, we have also a network so as a, an open stack tenant you can create your own networks you can create a network topology with routers and you can connect it to the outside wall or you can keep it um, inside only for your uh, virtual instances for example and all of this um, as i said earlier is automated uh, it's api driven this is important as well and thanks to that we can integrate um, access to this platform or with any other uh, platforms that uh, understand um, you know using apis at the same time openstack itself has been designed to scale pretty well so the openstack infrastructure is composed of uh, a number of services and these services scale pretty well so when you have a platform when you have um in this case our main workloads will be containers right openshift and openstack and uh, if you need to scale the openshift cluster well with openstack that uh, that's an easy task because openstack has been designed to easily and seamless scale um, for compute for storage and for the services managing uh, these services and on the consumption of resources, uh, well, uh, we have OpenShift. Uh, OpenShift itself is also distributed in, in a cluster. OpenShift is in the infrastructure running OpenShift. And it, as you know, OpenShift is a self-service portal. Um, it, it helps developers to define applications, to share applications, to do the life cycle of these applications um, in a way that uh, well, we all know by now. Right, uh, with Kubernetes, but on asteroids. Um, okay, why are we doing this integration in particular with OpenStack? Um, you know, among all the products that uh, we can run OpenShift on, which you know, uh, it's it's a number of them. So OpenStack in the 
well, let me start first by um, OpenShift. So OpenShift is workload driven. That means that if I'm a developer and I'm using OpenShift, I don't really care about the underlying platform, right? It's open stack, yes, great, it's open stack. But what I really care is um, the portability of my applications, um, about having a platform capable of uh, coping with the load when I scale my applications and uh, having access and be able to automate my uh, workloads in the manner that, that, that I may find appropriate, right? CICDs, etc. cetera. So um, below we have uh, the underlying platform as OpenStack in this case. And we want to keep that experience that the developer expects, right? Uh, meaning that if I do this in AWS or if I do this in OpenStack, I want my application to work equally, all right? So this is on the one hand. Then why on OpenStack? Well, um, it's deeply integrated uh, what we are doing between OpenShift and OpenStack. What does that, what does that mean? Well, um, OpenShift, the infrastructure itself is aware with this integration that it's on top of OpenStack. So with that, um, it will, uh, for example, when you require a new volume, right? Well, the provider from OpenShift will make that request to OpenStack via the API, right? And then OpenStack will provide it and then it will be presented to the container. Um, moreover, um, optimizations, which are part of the integration as well, um, Network-wise, we have Courier. Courier is on the OpenShift site, um, an SDN, right, connected to the OpenShift uh, CNI. And on the other hand, in OpenStack, it's a plugin for um, Neutron, right? So Courier will be able to make um, connectivity uh, without performance penalty, right, between OpenShift containers and uh, VMs on top of OpenStack. Um, if you think about this, uh, OpenShift itself uses uh, VXLAN tunnels to communicate the containers running on top of them. And it happens that OpenStack does the same as well. OpenStack uses VXLAN. Well, it's one of the uh, plugins for Neutron, but it's the most used one and the default one. And uh, it also uses uh, VXLAN tunnels to communicate the VMs internally between them, right? So um, since we wanted OpenStack to be able to host containers in VMs and in bare metal as well, but in this example in VMs, we needed a way um, to optimize that so that a container doesn't have to go when it goes to another container or another VM through the VXLAN tunnel of the OpenShift uh, platform and then the VXLAN tunnel of uh, OpenStack. So Curia solved this issue and it's an important part of the optimizations that uh, we are doing with this integration. Then uh, we have Octavia as well. Octavia uh, in OpenStack is, well, it's the load balancing as a service um, that you can use. And um, that comes very handy when you are running uh, OpenShift. And again, um, we wanted to make it transparent for the developer. So OpenShift and the OpenStack provider for OpenShift will make sure that whenever you need um, a load balancer, well, um, you just request it via API to OpenStack and that is presented to, to OpenShift. And all of it, again, transparently to the, to the end user. Um, what else? OpenStack is, as I said, uh, API driven. 100% with you know all the actions that you can do on OpenStack for storage, for networking, for compute, right? Meaning that you can um, program these tasks uh, perfectly from your applications, uh, from the OpenStack provider for OpenShift as well, or a combination of the two, right? Because, okay, I keep saying that the developer doesn't care too much about uh, the underlying platform, but what if he or she cares, right? Well, uh, in that case, uh, you could combine um, the two platforms and your application could perfectly be making use of OpenStack because you know that uh, you are running uh, containers on top of OpenStack and OpenShift, right? And this is common as well. Um, when you are, for example, migrating um, a traditional application running on VMs, running on OpenStack, and you are containerizing it, well, you're in that process, you may want to have access to the two um, um, yeah, applications, no, or, or the same application running on the two 
platforms, right? So you have access uh, through APIs um, from your application if you want to open a stack as well. What else? Um, well, fully managed. What does that mean? Uh, at Red Hat, we have a number of applications to provide management for these platforms for OpenShift, OpenStack. Um, one of them is uh, Cloud Forms, which is Manage IQ uh, upstream, um, another open source project that you can download, check it out. And um, it's, you know, it's like a single pane of glass for multiple uh, providers, being providers OpenShift, OpenStack, Amazon Web Services, right? So in one view, you have access uh, and management uh, for all these platforms, right? Again, this comes very handy when we are working with this integration. Uh, when you are the operator, um, you really appreciate to have this visibility of, uh, in this case, these two platforms. And you can even add uh, more platforms uh, supported by Manage IQ or, or Cloud Forms. As you know, uh, we work with Ansible um, a lot at Red Hat. Uh, Ansible is part of our uh, portfolio and it's also integrated um, you know it's integrated with OpenStack it's integrated with OpenShift as we're going to see in a minute and all of this is part of a bundle that we call the the Red Hat Cloud Suite right that includes things as uh, such as uh, satellite if you know satellite uh, well it's a very uh, cool tool that allows you well life cycling of packaging, uh, visibility of what's installed and where and uh, uh, to what version, etc. And it's widely used um, across, you know, any uh, OpenStack, uh, sorry, OpenStack as well, but uh, Red Hat in general uh, users. And in this stack that this slide uh, is, is um, having at the bottom, you see Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And well, this, needs no presentation, right? Uh, RHEL is a solid foundation. It's an operating system that has been uh, trusted and respected for many years in the industry. And uh, all the stock is based on, on RHEL as well. Okay, let's see a deeper life. Um, not very deep, uh, but you know, slightly deeper how all of this is working together. Um, so here you can see uh, at the bottom the hardware, right? So, you know, cloud are servers running somewhere, we all know that, and those servers are um, representing here what we have in the data center, and on top of these servers, we are installing uh, OpenStack, right? Uh, we are installing Ceph. Ceph uh, is what we suggest, and, you know, it's the most used storage backend in OpenStack, I would say, at least, you know, when you combine it with OpenStack and uh, the distribution that uh, we ship OSP um, is, is widely used because of its simplicity and uh, scalability. And again, it's deeply integrated with, with OpenStack, right? Um, if we move one layer up is when we see here uh, OpenShift, right? OpenShift on running, uh, well, the infrastructure of OpenShift itself and the containers. Um, Let's talk about the management again. So Cloud Forms. Cloud Forms is uh, what I said, the single pane of glass uh, through which you can see both OpenShift with all the OpenShift resources, and you can manage these resources from Cloud Forms as well, uh, and OpenStack. Cloud Forms is uh, very um, flexible in the sense that uh, if you come up with a workflow because uh, it's something that you are doing over and over during the day, you can very easily call it in cloud forms, uh, create a button, create a display to see the output, and uh, you can have it in, in there integrated in your in your view, right? Um, this is just an example. I mean, it, it really is it's a very sophisticated tool, uh, simple to install, by the way. Uh, people uh, working with cloud forms know that. Um, unlike, you know, OpenStack, which traditionally has been uh, more of a complex beast, not so much now. We have really simplified OpenStack a lot in the last, I would say, uh, 10, yeah, especially starting in OSP 10, which was Newton, and we are now about to release OSP 13, uh, which is based on Queens, and it's way, way simpler to install. Actually, it's a couple of commands now. Um, what else? Okay, um, I mentioned satellite earlier as part of the uh, management suite. 
But then we have OSP director as part of, uh, well, this management. OSP director, um, you probably have heard of Triple O as well. It's the OpenStack installer, right? Um, Triple O because it's OpenStack on OpenStack, right? Director itself is a all-in-one installation of OpenStack that uh, happens to include also Ironic, right, in this all-in-one installation. Uh, and Ironic, I'm gonna talk about Ironic later today, is the bare metal provisioning service uh, that ships with OpenStack, right? So thanks to that, we have a tool capable of deploying and configuring software on bare metal, right? And this tool is mainly plain OpenStack. By the way, when I say OSP as the OpenStack distribution from Red Hat, um, at Red Hat we have a policy of all upstream first, so it's no different from uh, the upstream distribution of OpenStack. You have uh, the services, uh, everything that's downstream, uh, but as I said, uh, comes from upstream with no changes, right? Um, you should know that. Um, then we also have Ansible. Ansible is used, um, integrated with Director. Ansible is also used as, um, or with the installer for OpenShift in general and for OpenStack as well. Uh, sorry, I'm for, uh, yeah, yeah, for OpenStack as well, okay? Let's cover a little bit more of uh, Courier, as I said before. Um, Courier um, is doing that, is avoiding the double encapsulation that was uh, introducing, you know, a level of um, performance uh, penalty up until now. Uh, Courier ships with OSP 13, which as I said, is uh, going to be released um, hopefully next month, uh, during, you know, June. And um, it connects both platforms. It connects uh, to the uh, CNI part of OpenShift and to Neutron in the OpenStack side of things, right? And that helps with what I said uh, earlier, uh, with performance in particular. And um, well, OpenShift can really, and the containers in OpenShift can really make use of it for an efficient communication between VMs and containers. And containers between, uh, in between containers as well, uh, running on top of VMs. Um, ironic and bare metal as a service, as um, we refer to it uh, many times. Um, ironic again is installed as part of OpenStack, and in the same way that you have um, compute nodes uh, running KVM as the hypervisor, you will have ironic uh, running uh, plainly and directly on uh, the bare metal nodes. Sorry, you won't have ironic running there, ironic runs on the controllers. Ironic will manage those bare metal nodes. I'm gonna explain in a second. Um, okay, let's review a little bit, uh, an overview of the topology of uh, how this works. So in the boxes in the middle, what you see, uh, what they represent are uh, virtual instances on OpenStack, right? So for example, you have one virtual instance on the left uh, called the Bastion host. Well, this will be a host which you SSH and you start everything from there. You start the installation, etc. This is running on an existing OpenStack um, platform, right? So you have created this VM, you SSH into it, and you start working on the rest of the installation if you're working on installation from it. You have load balancers as well. A load balancer will uh, be a VM right a sophisticated vm but a, a vm um, and it will run um, and it will connect uh, to openshift whenever uh, you need load balancing services for your applications right uh, then you have the infrastructure of openshift itself running on vms by the way uh, we are working as we're going to see later in the roadmap on distributing everything uh, with this integration between vms and bare metal nodes at will. So you as an operator will be able to choose what's your best uh, topology and um, instruct the installer to do it as you as you defined, right? Today you can do it, but it's a more of a manual process that we are automating with inclusion of bare metal, right? Then at the bottom, you see OpenStack Cinder volumes. So OpenStack has a service that's called uh, Cinder, which 
offers you uh, block devices that are presented to the virtual machines. Basically, uh, when you attach a new block device to a virtual machine, all you see is uh, like a new hard drive, right? Uh, slash dev, slash SDC, SDD, etc. And uh, well, with this integration, what we are doing, and, and this is used usually for uh, persistent data, right? Uh, you are, uh, are familiar with the concept of the persistent volumes, so this is exactly it, right? Actually, it's uh, at times a one for one, like uh, when you present a, a, um, a single volume to a container as a PD. Okay, in this case, we are also using it for the infrastructure itself. So the registry is backed by. Uh, as in the volume, for example, okay? Then the networks, here you see two of them, one in blue, uh, the public network, and another one um, displayed in green, the private network. Those are networks uh, created as uh, part of the installation uh, on OpenStack, right? So they are networks managed by, in this case, the Neutron service, which is the uh, networking service in OpenStack, okay? And then you see things like uh, DNS, LDAP, NTP. Well, of course, uh, you may want to have DNS uh, for the external resolution, uh, obviously for the internal resolution as well. And then uh, what you can have is an extra VM with bind and it will be part of your infrastructure as well, right? And the same applies to LDAP if you are using LDAP. And if you want to add uh, an NTP server instead of using an external one, uh, this can be part of your infrastructure as well, all with OpenStack. Okay. All right. Let me cover real quick the Ansible, the OpenShift Ansible installer. Um, I'm giving you here the link. Um, OpenShift Ansible is the official OpenShift installer. You're probably familiar with that. And in particular, here we are interested in the uh, OpenStack playbooks to allow us uh, this installation in, in a very easy way. Um, it's based on Ansible 2.4, and well, you will if you go to the link that I showed to you earlier and click on the documentation file, you will see uh, the details of how to do this, how to, for example, configure OpenStack. What do you want out of OpenStack? How many VMs you want? How many networks? Uh, what are their names, etc. Uh, the same applies to the OpenShift configuration, right? Uh, do you want one infrastructure node, or do you want three infrastructure nodes? Uh, DNS configuration as well. So um, what's my DNS server? How do I access my DNS server so that uh, I can make the updates uh, with any containers, et cetera, right? Uh, courier networking configuration. Courier is uh, one option. It's the best option, right, in this context. But you may want uh, to tell uh, the OpenShift installer that you want a different SDN. Well, this is where you would do it uh, in the OpenShift installer. Etc. Right um, here, you can see that I also mentioned the um, credentials configuration. Obviously, you need your credentials in there, and uh, Cinda for both uh, persistent volumes and registry. Right, and if you are familiar with Ansible, the way it works um, is is with uh, playbooks. Uh, today, we have uh, one playbook for the provisioning of the resources on OpenStack, and another one that once those resources are created, then installs the OpenShift um, infrastructure in them, okay? Good, so let me cover real quick uh, the bare metal service. Um, as an OpenStack product manager, I also look after Ironic itself, uh, or better said, um, hardware provisioning, as we call it, which includes Ironic. Ironic is probably the most famous uh, product within um, the hardware provisioning at Red Hat. Um, Ironic is an enterprise ready bare metal as a service running on top of OpenStack. It's, it's an OpenStack uh, core service. Um, it's a trusted platform, it's been there for many years now, and it's multi tenants. Um, it integrates with the rest of the um, OpenStack services, right? With Neutron for the network, with Nova uh, for compute, as you're going to see in a second, uh, with Cinder. Um, the integration with Cinder is uh, mainly for allowing you to boot bare metal nodes on uh, Cinder volumes, right? Imagine you could have 
uh, these class servers and you still want to use them, right? So you could do that. Uh, you could have uh, seen the volumes created and then have your bare metal nodes booting from them, right? The goal here in our strategy since the beginning has been to have a platform for bare metal provisioning on par, future-wise, with that of the uh, virtual instances on OpenStack, right? And I'm going to cover everything that I've written in these uh, slides, uh, but this is probably a good summary highlighting all the benefits and uh, features that you have with Hironic, right? Starting by its simplicity, how it is used in different use cases, for example, as an installer for OpenStack in the other cloud use case, uh, right? It, it covers inspection of the hardware itself. It's able to talk uh, LLDP to extract information from switch ports, from the NIC cards that the um, bare metal nodes have, etc. Right, so it's a really, really comprehensive service, um, future rich, and let me say that today, very easy to use. Right, so the workflow is basically, uh, I have a new server, I register this server by a Pixie booting it to the ironic service, and after that, that server is ready to be used. Okay, it integrates uh, directly in the um, servers that are there ready for the tenants or OpenShift in this case uh, to use. Okay, and this is more or less, um, I would say, a logical um, uh, diagram or architecture of how this works. Um, our tenant on the left is OpenShift Ansible, right, uh, to start with, which is the installer, the installer of OpenShift. And how does OpenShift Ansible install OpenShift on OpenStack uh, using both Ironic and um, virtual machines, virtual instances in OpenStack? Well, via the API, right? So basically you instruct the API, hey, give me a number of networks, give me a number of virtual instances, give me a number of uh, physical nodes, right? When all of this is ready, let me know, and I'll go ahead and deploy OpenShift on them, all right? So this is what you have. Um, I'm showing here uh, the API. Um, there are multiple APIs in OpenStack. Uh, this conversation between OpenShift and the API is uh, mainly through Nova, right? Obviously, you end up always um, talking to the um, credential uh, service, which is um, Keystone, and other services uh, such as uh, Cinder, right? But in this case, the most important um, communication, I would say, to start with uh, for creating the resources is that it's uh, via Nova. Um, the integration of Ironic, I made a note here, in OpenShift Tansible is currently a work in progress um, and a lot of work that we are doing uh, as we speak. Uh, we plan, um, and you know, this is a plan. Huh? Don't don't uh, take my word for for it, because you know we uh, can have delays. We'll finish earlier as well. Uh, the plan is by the end of the year we should be uh, ready to do this end to end. Uh, you know, with uh, stability and supportability with Ironic, right? So having OpenShift aware of uh, the Ironic service and using it. Today, you can still install it on bare metal, no problem at all, but um, OpenShift doesn't know. I mean, oh, sorry, OpenShift Tansible, the installer, doesn't know about it, okay? You should do it transparently. Good, let me cover now the uh, roadmap, um, which I think I started talking about it. Um, what are we doing? Uh, what are we finishing doing now? So we are releasing, if everything goes to plan, uh, next month, um, OSP 13 in Queens, right? Uh, definitely this summer, hopefully next month. Uh, in Queens, OpenShift Tansible uh, will be able to create all the resources on OpenStack, as I said, without any uh, interaction from the installer, from the uh, person using OpenShift Tansible, right? Up until now, OpenShift Ansible for OpenStack expected that you had created the resources, right? The VMs, etc. And when you have them, you just tell OpenShift Ansible, hey, here are my resources, go ahead and deploy everything. But since uh, OpenStack is um, uh, API driven, why not uh, using the same installer to do this? And this is what we've done. We finished this work, and um, hopefully, you'll be able to, to test it uh, pretty soon.
The other big improvement, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in OSP 13 uh, OpenStack Queens is uh, the introduction of Courier, right? Courier to solve uh, or to improve, uh, rather, the performance of the uh, network when you are communicating uh, containers and VMs, containers and containers in different VMs, right? Um, and Octavia load balancing integration, and this is also a big one, right? Octavia is uh, supported uh, in in um, in Queens, and the plan is that uh, it will be fully integrated as well with OpenShift. So the default load balancer for OpenShift and OpenStack will be Octavia. What else are we doing? We're doing many things uh, this year and next year. Hopefully, everything that you see on the middle column and on the right one uh, will will be able to to ship. Uh, starting by the integration with MemMetal that I explained earlier. So something, if you're familiar with Triple O, or maybe if you even are a developer, you may have seen uh, that Triple O is now um, able to deploy uh, OpenShift, right? So via Ansible, so basically using Ansible, uh, OpenShift Ansible, right? Uh, now Triple O knows about it. Uh, it has templates that basically call the playbooks in OpenShift Tansible and does everything in a very similar way to what you do for installing OpenStack, right? So this is pretty cool. Uh, this is very exciting and it's really a very nice way and quick to deploy OpenShift on bare metal, right? Plain and simple. We are also doing the same. This is more sophisticated in the over cloud. So um, the terms under cloud and over cloud, uh, the under cloud is the node that has a triple O in it, uh, our director. We talk about downstream. And the over cloud is the OpenStack platform that your users, uh, your tenants are using, right? Uh, with all the services, not just those services for installing uh, the over cloud as the under cloud, but uh, everything else, including Ironic, of course. And um, we want OpenShift Tansible to be able to point at any over cloud and uh, an empty over cloud, you know, an empty OpenStack platform and say, please install OpenShift for me. Uh, me being a tenant, not an operator in this case, just a tenant who has access to an OpenStack uh, platform. And after the installation, I have my own OpenShift infrastructure ready for me to use, right? So you're only limit will be the quotas that your uh, administrator or operator has set for you, right? So this is pretty cool. This could be called something like OpenShift as a service, if you like, right? Because it, this is pretty much what it is. Um, it, it's a way of self-servicing OpenShift in OpenStack platforms. What else? Uh, we are expanding the integration with uh, storage, right? I said earlier that uh, the registry, for example, if you use the OpenShift Tansible, is configured with Cinda, and that works very really well. But uh, we see a lot of use of uh, Ceph, and in particular uh, Ceph with uh, you know the Swift uh, compatible um, API S3, right? Rados Gateway. So why not using Ceph now as well uh, with Rados Gateway, just like Cinda can use Ceph or be backed by Ceph for the registry, uh, right? There's demand for that. Uh, we see that. Uh, this is what many customers are doing. So we are uh, adding this uh, feature to OpenShift Ansible, right? Um, something important as well, you probably have seen that um, in, in the Kubernetes repositories, uh, and a standalone Cinder service. What does that mean? Well, um, Cinder, as I said, is what uh, gives you block devices from OpenStack. When you are a bare metal node, you can, bo you can boot that node from a Cinda volume, but you cannot, once this uh, bare metal node is up and running with an operating system, you cannot attach uh, volumes to it, right? That's not something that Cinda is uh, able to do. But if you have containers, if you have OpenShift containers in that node with pods, um, you still want to be able to present uh, Cinda volumes for the PVs, right? So for this, what you do is uh, using the standalone Cinder. You will install the standalone, or not you, the OpenShift Ansible will do that for you. Install it in the bare metal nodes, and all of a sudden you have, again, the same experience that you have with virtual machines, where transparently um, you get uh, Cinder block devices connected to the virtual machines and in turn uh, becoming PVs for your containers. 
the same exact experience with bare metal nodes, right? Thanks to a standalone Cinder. Check it out, it's there in the Kubernetes repositories. It's, uh, you, you can use it now. And what we are doing is integrating it uh, in, this, um, in this workflow with OpenShift Ansible, right? Um, also, again, uh, the ability to scale out, scale back in um, from Ansible, right? Uh, you can scale out and scale in, no problem at all, uh, as you are probably doing right now. But what we want is uh, an automation of this, um, a, a manual automation. Automation, what I'm saying right now, is with Ansible. Me as an operator, uh, having control of this, right? Saying, okay, I need to scale my workers with uh, three more bare metal nodes. All right, so I go there and I say plus three, install them, and uh, by the time the playbook's finished, boom, you have them, okay? Uh, so this is what we are doing, you know, with high priority as we speak. And beyond that, well, uh, we have big plans, um, and one of them is integration with Manila. Manila brings to the table something really important, uh, which is uh, multiple uh, rights to the containers, right, RWX. And um, when we have uh, this integration through Manila, the PVs can be presented also from Manila when you have this use case where you want to have multiple containers uh, reading and writing from, from the same uh, persistent volumes, okay? Um, what else? Well, uh, we are also, uh, working on uh, auto scaling, right? I skipped one on purpose uh, because um, some of the plans around that are uh, changing, uh, which is uh, the deployment of OpenStack itself in OpenShift, right? So uh, don't read that one. Um, I, I delete it. <laughs> and uh, OpenShift auto scaling is also something pretty cool that. Um, you know, it, it has some uh, pretty requirements that uh, we are working on as well. Uh, and uh, we plan to introduce this, having OpenShift auto-scaling based on metrics uh, when running on top of OpenStack. And then integration with uh, DNS. If you know, I mentioned earlier that the most common thing is uh, running bind, uh, bind 9, and use your external and maybe internal as well um, uh, neighbor solution through it. But OpenStack uh, has uh, designate DNS as a service. So with that, what we want is to integrate it with um, OpenShift. So making OpenShift Ansible aware of this service and, and, and use it for OpenShift. Okay. Um, all right, so this is the end of the presentation, but I wanted to let you know that on Monday, uh, we have this session again. I'll be there in Vancouver, and you know, if you want to uh, reach out to me in person, uh, you'll find me there um, at the end of the presentation next week on Monday. Well, thank you very much, Raymond. Um, if there are any questions, um, let's see what's coming in in the chat here. Uh, Trevor is asking, would designate eventually replace DNS MAS queue or would it be intended to run alongside it? And Jacob has a few other questions too. I'm okay. Sure. And might have um, how you say DNS MAS queue. Right. So I'm not familiar with uh, DNS MQ, but um, designate uh, will be the an option. Right, uh, that instead of using bind or other uh, uh, DNS resolvers that you may have, for example, the one that comes with CoreOS, um, you can have um, DNS as a service via designate connected to your OpenShift. It will be an option. Uh, you will need to tell uh, the installer that you want to use DNS as a service. Um, yeah, and maybe let me add. Um, when we are doing this, um, many of the things that you will see, for example, I mentioned Courier uh, a few times, um, it's options that you have as an operator to deploy and design the architecture and the topology of what you want, right? It's not like this integration forces you to use um, all the services that are integrated, but only those that you think are right for your environment. Jacob, just unmute yourself and ask your questions. Okay, thank you. Um, Ramon, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. 
Um, so I think I'm going to be delivering something like this the Sunday uh, before OpenStack Summit. Yes, at the training. Um, yes. yes. So, um, so everything in here is okay for a public audience? No NDA required? No NDA required. Everything is okay. Everything that we are doing here is upstream. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, just one... Um, one suggestion, I might add a slide that shows, uh, that just kind of visualizes the overcloud and the undercloud, because sure. uh, you do mention it a few times, and I think it's important that um, people understand that relationship. So when you talk about, you know, ironic in the undercloud versus the overcloud, they, they yeah, have right. some. Yeah, yeah but, good, good point. Yeah, thanks for that. Sure. Uh, one question. Um, this vision for mixing uh, VMs and bare metal, you, you have a slide on that? Yeah. Would that be something like the master and infrastructure OpenShift nodes would be deployed in virtual machines and the okay. application servers would be deployed in bare metal? Or is that, it that yeah, that's the most common uh, use case. Uh, this is what uh, we are uh, planning for. So and this is the first thing that uh, we are testing. But you can also install your infrastructure service uh, if you want on bare metal, right? But the most common thing uh, will be that having your infrastructure on uh, virtual instances and a mix of vms and uh, bare metal nodes for the workers okay and then um but so you could in theory put your infrastructure nodes master nodes yeah. on bare metal but, but but why would you want to okay got it yeah. the um and then i assume you would deploy the OpenShift bare metal application server alongside a Nova compute uh, hypervisor. So you would have, would you, yep. you would yeah. have both, would both be deployed by director, I guess? Um, director will deploy only on bare metal, as you know. So director will have to deploy everything on bare metal, the infrastructure and um, everything else, the workers. Ah. Yeah. Um, oh, it, it, yeah. Yeah, in the over cloud though is where uh, you as a tenant, uh, when run OpenShift um, uh, Ansible against it, uh, will be able to do this uh, mixed environment, if you will. So if so, should we mention the director deployed OpenShift, or should that not be mentioned in this? No, no, no. Uh, we should mention that. Uh, oh. That's that's part of the plan. That's actually uh, something you can see. Uh, upstream, the templates are are uh, finished, and it's basically templates integrating OpenShift and Ansible in them. Okay, great. Okay, but the okay, I just wanted to disambiguate that because that part's a little confusing to me. Oh, okay. Well, that's good feedback. Let's uh, see if we can do that between now and Sunday then. <laughs> the um, let me see if I have anything else. I think that's it. The there's one other question that just came in from Tim. Um, is GPU supported on the roadmap? That's not something directly related uh, to what we are doing, right? Uh, so that would be two questions. One, is uh, vGPU supported in the OpenStack platform? Um, I would like to have the answer. I believe it's yes, right? There are plans around GPU, vGPU. I don't know the details of them. And then uh, is it supported on the uh, OpenShift side of things? Um, unfortunately, I don't know the answer to that. The, the answer to that um, is a question for Jeremy either and um, some of the work that we're doing with NVIDIA, and um, that is going to be the topic of a future um, OpenShift Commons briefing um, as soon as I can corral uh, Jeremy and the NVIDIA folks to um, coming on board and giving one. So probably, there should be a couple of blog posts around that coming out soon. So that's my answer. Uh, um, I can also speak to that one. So so currently GPUs are supported in OpenStack in a pass-through model. Um, so there's a PCI pass-through pass support. If you're familiar with um, Overt or Rev, that's kind of the HDEV model to expose it. So what that means is that um, if you spin up a virtual machine, you can attach a GPU to it, and the GPU will be available to that virtual machine exclusively for its lifetime until you delete it. The um, so you can't 
kind of take it off a running VM and give it to somebody else, and you can't share a single GPU across multiple virtual machines. That support is coming. We have it in Rev 4.2 right now. So once that version of KVM is, support, is supported by OpenStack, you'll be able to share a GPU across multiple virtual machines and disconnect a GPU from a virtual machine without destroying the instance. Um, we also support uh, GPUs directly in containers. And for people using OpenShift on top of OpenStack, I'd recommend they expose the GPU through OpenShift because uh, you can disconnect and reconnect uh, a GPU to a container in OpenShift today. It's the combo pack that um, we're going to probably get it. Have to do a deeper dive into um, leveraging um, GPU when you're running OpenShift and OpenStack. So that um, I'm going to save for a future briefing. Um, and there, as Trevor points out, there was a blog post on GPU support for OpenShift about four months ago. So that'd be on blog.openshift.com. Um, and there have been several updates, and there were a few. Um, talks at Red Hat Summit last week on it as well. So it's time to update our information. We'll get that out there. Are there any other questions? Going, going, gone, okay. Well, we will all be at Red Hat Summit. Treva, um, Jacob, I think Ramon, and a whole gang of other people from the OpenShift team, Ryan Jarvanen and Josh Wood are giving a training on the Sunday before, which is the Sunday coming up, um, which I think there are about five more seats on. It's free, it's called containers, Kubernetes and OpenShift, um, and you can you have to be registered for OpenStack Summit to attend, but if you're coming, um, please do. Uh, we've got a, a full room so far. We can hold 98, and we're at about almost 90 people registered. So. Um, if you get pushed onto the wait list, let me know, and I will try and release a seat um, or two. So with that, Ramon, thank you very, very much for um, doing taking the time to do this talk today. And yeah, Thank uh, you for organizing it. I look forward to seeing you all in my lovely hometown of Vancouver um, very shortly, in just a few days. So um, beers on me. And um, we'll um, definitely have to hang out a little bit. And if any of you on the call, um, or listening to this later at the OpenStack Summit, please drop by the booth, um, the Red Hat booth, and um, find us because we are definitely interested in talking to people who are deploying OpenShift on OpenStack already and getting their feedback. And if you're thinking about it, um, we'd love to talk to you too and get your feedback and requirements and um, make sure they're incorporated into this roadmap and future ones as well. So um, there you go. I think that's it. I'm looking to see if once more time, is there any more questions? And I will stop talking and we will meet you all next week. Take care, guys. Thanks, Ramon. Thank you.